morning. It's me, one of your favorite people. How do I know I'm one of your favorite people? Because you tune in every day to watch me weekdays at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So I know I must be at the top of your list because I'm here with you and you are here with me. So I am going to go ahead and start the show. But today I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do. But I'm just going to ask you to do it in a different way. I know I always say go bother somebody, go wake somebody up. Go be a pest and let them know that the roundtable talk show is on. But today, I don't want you to just be a pest. I want you to really sit and think and give it some thought to who you feel might be a good guest for the roundtable talk show. I know you know everyone. I know you have a lot of friends. You know entrepreneurs and authors and business owners. You know CEOs. You know people who are changing the world. And guess what? I have a platform that showcases their talent, builds them as an expert, builds them as an influencer, and allows them the opportunity to help other people. So think about that person. And while you're thinking, while you're sharing, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest and then... We'll see what we can do for you. Our first guest I was interested in speaking with because she had a lot of information on how to be successful, how to sell your business, how to be a serial entrepreneur. I want to introduce someone who sold her company to a larger company and what she's doing now, Ms. Deborah Sweeney. Good morning, Deborah. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. I'm excited. Deluxe is a large company. And we always think about, you know, I always talk about Amazon. Amazon started in its garage roughly 1995 years ago. And now, especially thanks to COVID, they're taking over the world. So it's a dream for a solopreneur or business owner to sell to a larger company that level. But before we talk about selling the company, let's talk about your journey. How did you become a business owner? How did you become an entrepreneur? So I'm a lawyer by trade, sadly. <laughs> for <better laughs> than words. Uh, and I did business law, um, intellectual property and corporate law. And um, one of my clients was the company that I ended up owning. So I went in house and the story is pretty interesting because the company was originally sold to Intuit, which is also a large company. Um, that does QuickBooks and Quicken. I ran the division under Intuit. And then in a similar time, 2008, 2009, when the economy was rough, I offered to buy the company out of Intuit and take it private again um, with the notion that I could build it up from a small business to something big where it wasn't a substantial and corporate, but it would be perceived uh, as something from perspective as uh, an opportunity for growth, um, both becoming, going from being a lawyer to being in corporate to spinning it out. Um, and the other piece of the puzzle was I had two little babies at the time and corporate life and travel was tough for me, um, similar to practicing law and being a partner in a law firm. So I really wanted to have some flexibility and being an entrepreneur afforded me that um, for 10 years. And then a year and a half ago, I received a few offers. I wasn't looking to sell the business, but it was crazy timing that I got a number of offers from larger publicly traded companies to buy my uh, company called My Corporation. So we do online legal filings. We help small businesses incorporate and form LLCs. So at all at once, this sort of hit me and it seemed like perfect timing. And so I was able to um, sell the business to Deluxe and a historic check company that 105 years um, of in business selling checks. And so really looking to evolve Deluxe into something that focused on small business and entrepreneurs. And so they acquired my division with that mindset. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to grow within the uh, corporate structure, which has been a, a true adjustment. Um, and now I run other divisions. So I'm an email marketing division and a logo design division. And then I still run the My Corporation division. So I'm learning back how to be in corporate again, which means a lot of meetings and um, and a little less quick action, um, right? You have to finesse your way through things and that's been a challenge, but also a really great learning experience. And now I have teenage boys and honestly, they could, if I travel, <laughs> they know I'm gone or home, so. <laughs> there was so much gold. That's like my favorite phrase to just look at what you said and just see the gold in it. Because sometimes when we're looking at our lives, it's easy for us. It's simple for us. You're like, I was a lawyer. I wanted to do this. I did that. I sold my business all in a day's work. But for everyone, it's not that easy. 
Were you always someone, I mean, even lawyers aren't always driven as far as business owners. They may know how to practice or they may even know how to talk and how to argue, but it doesn't mean that they have the ability to operate a successful business. Were you always from a young age, someone who was interested in business? I mean, did you have that lemon stand? Like what was it in you that really made business a priority? I mean, I think my best and worst quality is my naive confidence. I believe I can make things happen. And so I, I sometimes that serves me very well. And sometimes I'm like, oh, well, that didn't work out. And I move on. And I think that's been a really good quality. Um, at a super young age, I have been, I, I, when I first started college, my very first day, I drew out a map of how I was going to graduate in three years and with two majors and these things. And so I think I, I, I've had super supportive parents my whole life. And I, I just thought, well, I got this, I'm going to go. And so when challenges presented themselves, I don't necessarily fear it. I think as I've gotten older, frankly, I've been a little more risk averse. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in my 20s and acquiring the business and moving from being a partner in a law firm to, to working in corporate, I always felt like it was a, ch a challenge or an opportunity. So, um, and, and I usually, for better or for worse, try to turn failures into like, okay, how can I learn and move into something different or mm -hmm. something better? Um, and my mom always had this saying this or something better. And so I kept, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to take every opportunity and if it doesn't work for me, I'll find something different. And so um, I, I've been fortunate to just mm -hmm. moving. And to your point, you said go. And that's sort of how I live my life, right? You just keep on um, going. And I, I hope I instill that in my kids and in my colleagues and my team members. But I think when you are that way, people around you sort of lift you up and support mm -hmm. you. One of the things that I've seen during COVID is that no matter who the person was, from the top CEOs and executives to people on the front line as retail, everyone had to pivot. Everyone probably took a look at their life and said, okay, I don't know what this next step is for me. I don't know what the next step is for my business. And we had to figure out how to make it work. Was there a point in your time, especially in your life, over, especially over the last four months, where you had to have that conversation with yourself and say, okay, what do I do now in order to remain successful? Yes, I mean, I feel like, it, it, is it related to specifically the business? I felt like we had to be very nimble and strategic and not move into the corporate focus of um, slow and steady. We had to, so we developed new products like an e-notary product and um, which, because we knew people couldn't go into their banks. So we did online transactions or electronic notaries and tax filings for automated process. So in that way, I think pivoting in a personal way, I feel like um, I just try to keep my mindset fresh. Like I focused, I, I tend to be go. And so it was hard for me to stay at home and think about always being in one place. So I worked really hard on getting up early and exercising and having the right mindset and talking to my team in a way that hopefully lifted them up and got them driven in the right direction. And so I, I think that I've been focused on that. In the midst of that, I, I assumed running more divisions within Deluxe because Deluxe had some reductions in force. And I kept thinking, ah, oh, do I want to take on more? But this was an opportunity to learn and to grow. So when other people had um, impact to their, their jobs, I kept thinking, okay, I'm going to take on more and do more and try to work harder. And frankly, I tell myself, what else is there to do, <laughs> right? You can only work out so much, so you work a little bit more. And I think that's been a, a focus for me is I'm gonna double down now. And you know, then when things let up, hopefully be able to have more, more flexible personal time. The one transition, like you mentioned, is people going from brick and mortar to e-commerce or mm -hmm. offering more e-commerce type services. Now, I love the whole aspect of e-notary, and, and it can be a function at the forefront of your company, whereas I've seen other people who say, okay, well, this is a temporary change. Do you feel that it will be more of a temporary or permanent change with the focus on e-commerce services? I feel like it's more permanent. I feel like people have almost become accustomed to the notion of being able to find things online and to transact business online. The interesting thing, we work with the government for for um, business filings, so in corporations and LLC filings, like I mentioned, and even the government, which takes forever to do anything, has acted quickly in moving to online transactions. So where we used to have people have to walk the documents into the state, we can now do more online and inter interact with government offices more quickly. So they've worked more efficiently. So I feel like, at least as it relates to our business, that some of these transactions will be more permanent. People are 
even people who may have been in a generation where they didn't feel comfortable doing things uh, electronically are now moving there because a they have the time to do the research and figure it out understand the technology etc but also just the notion that um, it's faster and it's it could be easier and so you know optimize where you can and this e-notary thing is a whole industry where people never thought it was okay to have notarizations online and now you have you know a camera and electronic digital documentation, there's probably a lot more security to that in many ways than having them be in person and just bring in their ID. So there's, um, you know, the storage is better that we videotape it. So there's interesting nuances where the online transaction has actually led to more security and more um, privacy for, for small business owners as they're signing their paperwork than in other instances. So I think you learn and grow from each, each situation. I definitely agree. So we're going to come back to you. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. And I want to see how she made the pivot as well. Oh, look, there's a little cat. Hi, cat. Hi, cat. I get distracted all the, uh, all the time, but Lisa has a cat. But we'll come back to Lisa because I want to discuss this e-commerce aspect. And I want to introduce our next guest, Jill Hickson, who is the chief curator and founder of an online art boutique, which is the Art Arsenal. Good morning, Jill. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. Thanks so much for having me and being with these accomplished and inspiring um, entrepreneurs. Wow, Deborah, what a story, journey. Thank you. Yes, I have so many more questions. We talked about the beginning. We have to find out what else is going on with Deborah. But we were speaking to Deborah about the e-commerce aspect going online. I've spoken to so many business owners who never really thought about the e-commerce aspect of their business. They were content being a brick and mortar. The world goes to hell in a handbasket. I'm sorry, I apologize. COVID-19 <laughs> happened. And all of a sudden we're forced to pivot. When you think of art or you, you know, me, especially when you think of high end art, I think of going to an art gallery. I, mm -hmm. I think of taking a, a walk and taking a look at those pieces, but you have an online art boutique, correct? Yes. And um, we've, we've been online, you know, pre-COVID. I feel like I've been operating in this pre-COVID, nimble DIY, you know, cost-efficient creative being online before. So um, really the pivoting for our online um, art boutique, we, we custom design light, digital, and organic work that is specifically to create curiosity, conversation and connection for that spaces, the guests, the environment and the experience. Mm -hmm. So um, I've really been pivoting the messaging and the communication being um, you know, thoughtful and timely in our message about artwork and our services during COVID as well as racial injustices and everything that is going on in, in the way we market our artwork and, and our services. You know, whether it's on the website, social media, and email correspondence, LinkedIn, et cetera. When you say social justice, what is your company doing as far as social justice? You know, I is supporting, um, our, uh, the, our, our own artists who have a message of mm -hmm. social injustice in their artwork, supporting other artists, um, you know, verbally and in writing, um, supporting as in as many ways as we can, mm -hmm. um, in a natural way. And I think that's really important with pivots that you stay on track with your brand and your messaging and not all of a sudden we're fighting social justice, but that is a part and a natural part of our support and we're doing whatever you know we can to create the conversation to listen to sign the petitions etc and create the important change that artwork is part of definitely agree i just wasn't sure you know what role you decided to take to share the message about social justice and i love it's the fact that it's artists who have their own message but often artists you know just like artists with music is it's what's going on in that time. So people paint, people sing, whatever it is, whatever emotion they're feeling at that time. And a lot of people are feeling that social justice message, but they don't have a platform to, to get it out there. Exactly. And again, it's it's promoting it in a very you know natural, seamless, timely and relevant way to what your mission is already 
-hmm. and, and pivoting as needed, but not going off brand and looking like I'm just jumping upon this bandwagon, you know, now I really think uh, about things and bringing them to fruition, not only in the short one, but most importantly in the long run. Mm -hmm. That is very important, Joe. I have more questions for you. I'm going to come right back. I want to introduce our next guest, especially before we go off the topic of social justice, Dr. Lisa Schaefer. That is her specialty. She works with, she is the founder of FinQ.tv, but her focus is on spreading the message about social justice. Good morning, Dr. Lisa. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. And, and yes, my cat Phineas uh -huh. decided to join us, which is unusual because he doesn't usually, I had to put the other cat in the bedroom because I knew that he was going to jump into the shot, but I didn't know this guy would. <laughs> he wanted so, to see me. He wanted to come visit with he's me. He's really excited about this. He's purring in my ear. <laughs> Let's discuss social justice while you listen to the purr. Okay, great. Yeah, so Think.TV is a video chat platform that's very similar to Zoom, except that it has a schedule on the homepage of conversations that are uh, various topics that users post themselves. I don't propose the topics. It's up to whoever wants to have a conversation about social justice. So a lot of uh, the popular topics are environmental issues, Black Lives Matter, and feminism. And we typically have conversations going on every weekday evening. So around seven to 10 conversations scheduled per week. But then we also have what I call drop-in hours. And those go on about 10 to 14 hours a day. So if you drop into think.tv, and it's think with a Q, if you drop into think.tv, uh, anytime from six in the morning till about eight o'clock in the evening, West Coast time, or you know nine till eleven East Coast time, you will be able to find somebody on the platform who can have a conversation with you, or ask, answer some questions, or just get some dialogue going about whatever social justice issue you're concerned about. So when you say a conversation, so if I'm going to go there and I, I want to talk about um, anything, I can just start a conversation. You know, we need to make this world a better place. We need to take care of Mother Earth. We need to focus on, you know, make it just, we can start, a, there's a, we can start a conversation about anything. You got me stuttering here, Dr. Lisa. <laughs> like, I can't think of the question. So, right, if, if you're interested in Mother Earth, you can post the topic, uh, Saving Mother Earth, on the on Think TV's homepage. And then people from our user base will take a look at the homepage and see you know, what conversations are happening this week. They'll drop in, and whatever they're interested in, they'll participate in. Hmm, that's interesting. Because I had a whole lot of questions about what is going on. So who are the people who are responding to the questions? We have a lot of student organizations. A lot of college students participate on our platform. And they spread the word among their friends and their classmates and, and their student organizations at their university and get uh, participation that way. And then the student organizations tell their membership um, and, and it's not for the student organizations to host conversations, it's for the membership to continue the conversation, even when the student leaders are out working on something else. So it's, you don't have to be a member or you don't have to be a member of an organization, you don't have to be a leader of an organization in order to propose a topic. You can just stumble onto the platform, be interested in some kind of social justice issue, post the topic, and who, whoever else happens to stumble by that day, if they're interested in that topic, they can drop in by video chat and participate um, in whatever, how, wherever the conversation goes. So most of the time, some of the, the people who propose conversation topics do have a few talking points or questions that they bring up throughout the conversation, but most, for the most part, it's very free flowing. So the best, I, the best conversations are those who uh, 
spread the word to interesting people, bring in the interesting people and let the conversation go wherever it goes based on uh, whatever the interests are of the people who happen to be there. Mm, I think that's interesting. And it kind of reminds me of why I launched um, yet a third talk show. People were like, Sharifa, you have three talk shows. Yes. I wasn't even planning to have two talk shows, but you got to give the people what they want. So I started the roundtable talk show because I love to get information from a, a diverse group of people because, you know, Deborah may say one thing, Jill may say one thing, and Lisa may say, well, did you think about this? I'm like, no, you know what? I didn't think about that. And then all of a sudden we all talk, you know, because I believe change starts with the conversation. That's my focus. That's what I believe in. I don't care what it is. If you're trying to make a, a business better, if you're trying to make your marriage better, change starts with the conversation. So with the roundtable talk show, I felt that it was unfair to, to ask business owners and entrepreneurs and authors their view on social issues, because that's not really what they came for. They really came to the show to, to, to you know, talk about their book. So I launched Face to Face Talk Show, which is my show that airs Wednesdays at 10 a.m., which is later today, and we talk about these deep issues, but I often find myself being nervous because I don't know what everyone's views are, especially on face-to-face. -face. You know, they could come out and they could say just about anything. Has that ever been a concern of yours on your platform where, you know, may maybe people say they want to have this discussion, but all of a sudden it's like, okay, oh my God, I had no idea that's what they really thought. Yeah, so last night we had that issue because what happened was somebody proposed a topic who we hadn't met before, and that's totally great and encouraged, and, and we want that, but we couldn't really tell from the profile picture if they were just trolling us because it was one of those Black Lives Matter conversations, but then there was a picture of a bunch of white guys on a boat, and usually when people want to propose a conversation or post a conversation on the platform, they do drop into the drop-in hours, say hi to us, kind of ask us about the platform because they had never seen it before. And then they're like, okay, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, post a conversation, tell some of my people. And then, you know, uh, we get people from, the, from other organizations come in and participate. But what happened last night was this mystery person had a conversation proposed and, and there were a whole bunch of RSVPs posted. And uh, we weren't really sure if they were RSVPs from people he knew or if they were uh, people who came across a platform and just thought that's just a fantastic topic we really want to participate so and, and it was that one was getting more more RSVPs than normal so we weren't really sure what was going to happen so uh, so we dropped in and it was actually quite pleasant I, I, I wasn't sure if he was gonna like be normal at first and then turn into a troll just to, to uh, you know prank us but we haven't, we actually haven't had that issue yet. And we have some guidelines that we're drafting about like, what do you do if somebody becomes uh, a little belligerent or misbehaves in during the conversation? Because we don't want it to be the responsibility of just the host or the person who proposed the topic. It needs to be a responsibility of the community. And if, of course, if it's somebody who has no interest in uh, in being a part of the community and contributing productively. Well, then you can just you know block them off the platform like you can from most other video chat. Um, but if they are just angry about a certain issue that's going on in society and they happen to not agree with you, well, that's not a reason to to boot them out of the con conversation. That's a reason to try to to listen and be heard and uh, and make sure that everybody's concerns are addressed. I definitely agree. Again, change starts with the conversation. So we're going to come back to you, Dr. Lisa. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest because she is someone who I'm pretty sure answers a lot of questions from a lot of different people and is always focused on helping people. Lindsay Wander, she is um, from Worldwide Tutoring. Good morning, Lindsay. How are you? Hi, how are you? I am wonderful. I'm excited to have you as a guest on today's show. What, did, what have you thought of the conversation so far? I think it's good. It's it's really great for me to hear from other entrepreneurs who are 
active in the community and taking responsibility, not just in their own lives, but also in the community around them, because that's really what I inspire to have my students do. I'm constantly trying to get them to have that entrepreneurial mindset where they're reflecting and looking around them and always thinking of how can they not just improve themselves, but even improve the world around them. Mm, I think that's wonderful, but specifically because you're in tutoring. Talk to us about your business pre-COVID and post-COVID, because all businesses, I'm sure, had to pivot. But one of the areas where I saw the most struggle in general was in our school systems and our ability to teach our children. I was doing a show, and this was early in April, and I was relating a story about um, someone who their school system gave them a packet. Right. And they, they said they're going to go to FedEx, Kinko's, whatever it is, and print out this packet. And they asked me, they sent it to me and they said, OK, you know, is it OK? Do I just need to print it? So I looked at the packet and it was a it was one packet for each week. Each packet was 90 pages long. So 90 pages printed out, you know, for three per week. Right. Printed out at between. 50 cents to 75 cents a copy would have literally bankrupt her. So I was sharing this story and I was like, I can't believe this happened. And one of my guests said to me, she said, well, at least she received a packet. And I said, well, what does that mean? She said, our school system just told us, go home and teach your kids something. And I was like, well, what, I'm confused. What does that mean? She's like, no, that's what they said. They said, teach them something, like teach them how to do podcasting or learn a different language. But there was no packet. There were schools that didn't have computers or students who didn't have internet and Wi-Fi. So different people have been struggling. And I know that was a very, very, very long question, Lindsay, but I wanted to give you some <laughs> background on where I was. So what have you seen post-COVID, pre-COVID as far as the changes? Man, I could talk about this for so long, so I'll try to really summarize it up. But I think one of the issues um, underlying what you were describing is we're trying, people have been trying to mimic what happens in school in the home. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these educators are not equipped or trained or have experience being able to provide online instruction, minus the fact or added to the fact that we're in the middle of the pandemic and there's a crisis going on. And, you know, everyone just tried to carry on like business as usual by doing whatever was in the classroom at home. And it clearly didn't work. On top of that, I think that the layers were peeled off and people realized really what's going on with the education system. We tend to trust that we are handing our kids over to these professionals and they're learning the necessary skills, which often is the case. However, as a former educator, there's a lot of political red tape and you sometimes just don't have the time to teach the more essential life skills, which would have helped the students to easily transition to that schooling at home. So things like time management, creative problem solving, um, being able to entertain themselves with their own innovation and ideas. These are things that children should have incorporated into their curriculum so that whatever the world throws at them, they're able to be leaders in their life and in, in their community. So that's exactly what we saw of our students. You know, the world was kind of in shambles around them and they were doing great. They, you know, they were able to manage the work that they were given to the point that we basically put ourselves out of business in the spring. The students we currently had didn't even need us. And that's great. That's what I want, want to have happen. So what I did is a big pivot in the business of saying, this was a message. We This is something we've always done. We've always intertwined into the content, into the curriculum. Um, I called them learning and life skills, but I didn't really say what it was because I thought it might scare some people off who just want their kid to get an A in math, you know, and I'd say, sure, sure, we're going to give them an A in math. But in the meantime, I'm doing all these other things to them. So now I've just kind of um, put that message out there. I think people are ready to hear it. I talk about metacognition. I talk about executive functions. I talk about emotional intelligence and empathy, um, growth mindset. These are all things that everyone's nodding their heads because as an entrepreneur and as a successful person, we know that they're essential mm -hmm. for life, yet they're never taught. And being in a classroom and working with curriculum is a really easy way to make very minor shifts in the way that you speak to a child or the opportunities you present to them, which have huge impacts. Mm -hmm on what kind of person they grow to become. So I always say we try to get them to become competent and conscious leaders. 
So having the knowledge is one thing, great. You got an A in math, you got good ACT scores, you got into your top college, wonderful. What are you gonna do with that? Do you have the right mind? Do you have the right heart? And that's really what we also work on. I think that's wonderful because I always share this story that happened to me and it happened in real life. So it's just funny um, the way things work out years ago, even before COVID, I was having, you know, I'm in California, Long Beach, and we have the K through 12 program here, which is homeschooling and everybody just became a fan. So I was having this conversation with a friend of mine and I was telling her, I don't believe in homeschooling because I feel like you miss out on that social aspect. And she's like, no, I'm for it. It's wonderful. And her son was being home. He's very smart, wonderful student. He became the valedictorian of his class. He went to give his speech, looked out at the auditorium full of people, broke out in tears and ran off the stage. And I was like, see, that was exactly my point. But in COVID, especially, you don't have a choice. You don't have the luxury of even making a decision on whether or not you're homeschooling or not. It seems like a very easy issue, but it's what we're dealing with right now. September is fast approaching next month. In August, some people are supposed to go back to school this year, and parents are like, I have to work. You know, I have to do something, but what do we do with the children? So what can we do with that social aspect, Lindsay? So one of the pivots that I've done in my business is I'm starting to create these COVID learning pods where the families are agreeing to basically only interact with each other and not to put themselves in a lot of at-risk situations. And then we have daily temperature checks and masks worn indoors. But what that does is get the children somewhere for a few hours a day with a professional instructor in very small groups. I cap it at seven kids. And then it allows them also to have that social interaction um, in addition to, we can also do all the underlying learning and life skills while we're helping them with their e-learning and making sure assignments get turned in. So the other unforeseen part of that that's beneficial is we are starting to rent out business spaces, businesses that have closed their doors, um, Airbnbs. I'm in Chicago. A lot of people aren't coming here. So it's like a win, 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 win. You know, everyone's kind of winning. I actually just recently brought on another 20 tutors. So we're creating jobs. So there's, you know, benefits all around. It's obviously still risky. It's not as safe as completely abstaining from any contact with anybody, but it does solve a lot of those issues with um, social interaction, which I see more as a problem with the younger, the elementary students, the middle and the high school kids, they're figuring it out. I, I think that they should just deal with the remote learning. <laughs> We're fine. Minus, I do have some students with learning difficulties, and that's another area where, you know, sometimes they need more of that in-person or that social interaction. So it just goes back to every family's different, every kid's different, but we are pivoting. We're trying to find ways to, to help. <laughs> Yes, that's what we have to do. Now, I am going to come back to you, Lindsay. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest. I think I'm going to introduce him before he disappears. He just keeps getting lower and lower and lower <laughs> in his chair. So I got to go get him before he's gone. I want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Alan Licka. Dr. Alan Licka is famous and he's gracing our platform with his presence today. We got a lot of questions for him, a lot of questions we're going to answer, but he is the leading cosmetic dermatologist. He's published over 17 books, has done over 30 plus academic papers. He hosted the number one internet show inside cosmetic surgery today. Good morning, Dr. Alan. How are you? You know, it is such a pleasure to be on such a room with so many beautiful, intelligent, empowered women that I can't really believe it. I mean, wow, I, I woke up and I said, I must have been in heaven today, Sharifa. <laughs> it's just truly an amazing thing. And, and I'm so amazed at all the things all these women are doing to help change the world because it really has become a different world since COVID. The world has totally, completely been turned upside down. We've been in a topsy-turvy world where everything has gone berserk and crazy. And it's not the same world we used to live in just a few months ago. I, I mean, the beginning of March, I was in the first week of March, I was in Mexico. Before I went to Mexico, I told my wife, you know, we could go to Mexico, but I'm not sure we're going to get back. 
Mm-hmm. And she said, yeah, right, right. We got back just barely on the last plane that they were letting in. And then everything shut down for four or five months. It was like, it was like the, everything had gone berserk and everything had gone crazy. And all this snowballed so quickly, we couldn't handle it. And no one can handle it. Now, my life has been one where I've had drastic, complete, radical change. And so I'm used to change. I, I, I'm very used to things. And that's why I think I'm probably on this panel is because uh, my life changed drastic in 2003 when I was walking in Disneyland with my wife. And my wife turned to me and said, what's wrong with you, hon? And I, for once in my life, I hadn't said anything wrong. I hadn't done anything wrong. I hadn't even thunk anything wrong. So I didn't know where she was coming from. But, you know, I had suddenly and mysteriously developed a right foot drop. And so Mm. my wife, out of concern, said, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, I don't know. And she said, well, when we get back, you better get this checked out. (laughs) Now, you women, when you say that and mean it, you mean it. I mean, there's no option in this. So I knew I had to get it done. So I saw thousands of doctors and they did tests on me, Sharifa. They did brain scans, they did cat scans, they did pet scans, they did scan (laughs) scans. And you know what they did, they found at the end of the day? What? They found absolutely nothing. Mm. You know, I'm a doctor, and when we find absolutely nothing, you know what we do? Keep looking. We make more tests, we do more Mm -hmm. tests. So I had a billion dollars worth of tests back then, billions of dollars, I'm sure. I had tests that didn't even exist then or today. And and then I ended up on the doorstep of a world leading neurologist. And that neurologist uh, invited me and said, hi, Dr. Laika, you better be sitting down when I tell you this. Mm -hmm. I said, why? I got a dropped right foot. He said, no, you don't. You have ALS, Lou Gehrig's Mm -hmm. disease. In six months, you're going to be dead. Get your affairs in order. Oh, wow. Wow. So I said to him, you know, can you prove this diagnosis? He said, of course, an autopsy. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. So, so I'm used to radical change, women. That was radical change. Now, when you go through something like that, you go through a grief reaction. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about the grief reaction. She said it was about anger. It was, you go through an angry phase where you can bite the head off nails. You go through bargaining. Oh God, please don't let this happen. I'll do anything if this doesn't happen. You go through denial. Oh no, there's nothing wrong. I can do anything. But in your heart of hearts, you know something's wrong. And then you go through depression and depression's the worst phase because you can't move a muscle. Your body can't do anything then and you just can't do anything. So, you know, after going through all this, I asked my wife, you know, what do I have? She says, I really don't know, dear, uh, but you're a doctor. I'm a doctor. You can figure it out. You're smart. Well, I said, thanks for the vote of confidence, but I just saw thousands of doctors and they couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So she said, well, figure it out. So, you know, back in 2003, uh, something new was invented. You might've heard about it, ladies. It was called the internet. Ever ever hear of that thing? I have. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think, time on it. <laughs> yeah. I think Al Gore invented it, didn't he? Or something like that back then. Yeah. Well, I think that's an internet rumor. <laughs> that's a real internet rumor around the thing. But so I, I had some friends. They mm-hmm. helped me with the internet because back on them, you could only use dial on connections. Mm-hmm. You know, that was your phone contacting another phone and going re ah, re ah, re ah for like 20, 30 minutes. And finally, you connected and you didn't even know you connected. And then you had to have to look up every site because there was no Dr. Google. There was no ALL. There was no Yahoo. There was nothing to help you back then. So you had to look up. But I had friends that were nerds, thank God. And they mm-hmm. geared me to the site. And I found a doctor in Colorado Springs that had what I had, except mm-hmm. he got worse much more rapidly than I did. He was on his deathbed when doctors from around the world were coming to see him. And one Mm -hmm. doctor from Texas came up to see him and said, you know, David, I don't think you have ALS. I don't think you have Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. And David said, what do I have? He whispered because he was so weak. The doctor says, I think you have chronic Lyme's disease. I think Mm -hmm. you've been bitten by a tick and it's mimicking this ALS. Mm -hmm. So he started on treatment and like Lazarus, he arose from the dead. Mm -hmm. So that's when I knew I had to go see David. I got on a plane, I met him in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It was a trip from hell because 
You know, when you go from Denver to Colorado Springs, yeah. the air comes off the desert and that plane drops over and over again. It climbs, it drops, it climbs, it drops, it climbs. You girls have probably been on a plane like that sometimes, <laughs> but it's an awful flight. It's okay. like the drop of doom times 20. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I got off that plane and there was David on the tarmac to meet me. He was a well-known doctor. It was before your high security and everything else back then. So he met me and we talked and he said some magic words. History repeats itself and mm -hmm. I'm going to make you better. So for over 30 years, I maintained my status as the top cosmetic doctor in North America without that. But the important thing, I found it was an important thing to serve people and serving people became my life. And that's the message I have now. I wrote a book with a co-author called The Secrets to Living a Fantastic Life. And in it, my co-author and I write about 13 golden pearls, pearls of wisdom that everybody can use. Everybody has inside themselves to do that. And ladies, I'd like to offer you some golden pearls if you'd like. If you can get in touch with my girl, Tammy, T-A-M-I, at Lyka, L-Y-C-K-A dot C-A, Make sure it's CA because I'm a Canadian. And I like to point that out. And Tammy at Laika.ca. And we'll send you five little golden pearls. And each one of them has a little saying or mantra with it that you can use in your regular day to make it better for you. So okay. when I was on this show, Sharifa, I wondered how I can help your people because this is what this is all about and what service I can do for your wonderful ladies here because they really are changing the world. They're changing the world in their own way. And one thing I do a lot is mastery, mindset mastery. And, and my book helps so many people because of those golden pearls. I'd love everybody to read it, especially in the book, because it became a bestseller in the pandemic of 2020. My God, that's amazing. And, and you know, the thing that we do is I'm a professional speaker, my co-author, is a person by the name of Harriet Tinka, who was kidnapped, stabbed, and left for dead. And so we're giving 20% of this book process to charities that end domestic violence. Mm. So if you buy the book through fantasticlifebook.com, 20% of that book cost will go directly to a charity in your area that helps women shelters, directly in your area. I so, love it. I think that's so, fantastic. So, so that's what we do here is I'm trying to help the world. I try to show people that it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens. I try to show people that you can become empowered. Now, all you ladies are empowered already, so I don't have to do that for you. But there's so many people beaten down right now by this COVID. There's so many people hurting right now. There's so many people that are on the verge right now from this COVID that I can't imagine the amount of pain and suffering they're doing. So again, I if, definitely you know agree. Anybody, if you know anybody that needs some help, get them to go, call my girl because I give 10 minutes of my valuable time and they might be able to put some of their pieces together with that. That's Tammy hey, at Laika.ca. And Tammy maybe, maybe at Laika.ca. Tammy, T A M I at Laika.ca. We're definitely going to reach out to Tammy because I always like pearls. But I want to go back real quick, Dr. Allen, to our other guests. But before we do that, what a, just give us one pearl. You got to give us a little taste, just one pearl that we can present to our audience. Okay, I'm going to tell you one that's one of my favorite ones. It's a short story. Uh, one of my favorite pearls is enthusiasm. And once there was a carpenter by the name of Fred that had lost his enthusiasm. He had worked for a company for 65 years and he was done. So he went to his boss and threw his keys on the desk and said, I'm done. I'm, I can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, the boss was taken aback. This was his best carpenter. He said, Fred, can you do just one more job for me so that we can help you so that you can help me with my last job? Well, Fred thought about it and begrudgingly, he said, yes, Sharifa. He said, I'll do it. You know, I love this job. It was the best job I ever had. But he did the job, but he wasn't enthusiastic anymore. He dragged his butt to work. He only did two hours a day. And at, it was a miracle, but the house still passed inspection. So he went to his boss and threw the keys on the boss's desk as he had and said, I'm done, I'm gone, bye. He said, just wait, Fred, one more minute. Everybody gather around. This is Fred's last day. 
He's helped me for all the years of this company. He's made this company great. And I want to reward him for all his enthusiasm for me. Fred, here's the keys to the last house you ever built. Live in it and then love it just the way you did the company that you were in. Do you understand what I'm saying there, Sharifa? That yes. enthusiasm carries the day. And yes. I don't care that this is a Wednesday, you gotta be enthusiastic <laughs> on Wednesday. I don't care if it's Monday, you gotta be enthusiastic on Monday. I don't care if it's Friday, you gotta be enthusiastic on Friday. You gotta carry the day with your enthusiasm, otherwise you're never going to make it happen. So I every, love that. every chapter in our book has a story like that. It's got this dynamic dialogue between Harriet and I, and it's sprinkled with over 145 quotes of world authorities so people can really take this meaning to heart. So this book changes the world just a little bit, and we'd love it to I'm change gonna, everybody's world. Yes, I'm gonna pick up my own copy today. I love picking up the books from our guests, so I definitely wanna check that out, but I wanna go back real quick to one of our, um, another one of our guests, Jill. Let's talk about enthusiasm. How do you maintain that enthusiasm in your life with your business? Yeah, you know, well, I think I, like the five P's, passion, purpose, perseverance. Um, I can't remember the other two right now, but I use that, you know, for the art, my art business, the art arsenal, but I also have kind of came at the same time, came to fruition, the writing den, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we help those in need specifically the homeless, connect, communicate, and create through handwriting. So we have eight live um, events, now virtual. Um, they're slowly coming back online in New York, which is the number one as far as homelessness. Uh, San Diego is number five, and Seattle is number three. So I think having that, that the passion and the purpose and your natural enthusiasm you know, personally and whatever your your venture is um, helps. And, and knowing that also you're giving back, you know, um, I think a lot of the things that Lindsay talked about for the children, um, it needs to be instilled in business people these days. And enthusiasm is one along with being empathetic, especially during these challenging situations, you know, whether it's health or economic or, or social or all three. And um, so that's that kind of, and it kind of drives me. I've always been an enthusiastic person. It, it gets a little more challenging, I have to say, when when you're an entrepreneur and you're having to get up and do this every single day and put it out there, and knowing you're probably going to get little or back, but still, you know, feeling good about it. I think it's in your heart. I mean, I think that's what I was saying when we were speaking earlier with Deborah is, yes. yeah, I understand that you've done all these things, but it's usually something in you, something in that in you as a person that allows you to do all those things because you can take two separate people with the same circumstances, the same business and get completely separate results. Um, we mentioned, Lindsay, you mentioned Lin Lindsay, Jill. How do you maintain your enthusiasm, not only with the students, but with your business as well? You know, I think it all comes from originally I pursued my passion I followed my intuition and there really isn't a day I wake up and I dread it. You know, I'm, I'm as long as I come at it with a with an enthusiasm for learning and for teaching, then that is in itself a lesson. You know, I'm, I'm showing them through my own behavior, um, whether it's my tutors, whether it's the parents or the students, whoever it is that learning is fun and, and teaching is fun. And um, there's a big wide world out there that you should be excited about. I definitely agree. Now, Deborah, again, we spoke about your enthusiasm earlier in the show. So many people I believe would have sold their company, taken what they earned, bought a boat, headed out to the middle of nowhere, came back two years later with a beautiful Ted and a whole lot of fish on a hook. I don't know, I just made that up. Yeah, but yeah. you just kept going. How did you just keep going? And how did you maintain your enthusiasm for business as opposed to just, you know, taking a vacation? I feel like um, my team is what made me where I was successful. The support of the team that built, that supported me through buying the company out from Intuit, building it for 10 years and then selling it again. Um, and frankly, I felt like I owed it to them. I also feel like one of the things that was embraced within corporate 
about me, I think was my enthusiasm. People were shocked to see someone who came with passion because maybe corporate tends to be a little less um, enthusiastic on a day in and day out basis. And so I think there's this um, notion of it's, it's fun to have Deborah in these meetings because well, I, I, I bring a, an entrepreneurial spirit and I'm unquelched by the, the limits. And I feel like, well, I have nothing to lose. And, and I, I could go on a, on a boat, but I enjoy the stimulation of the people and the interest. And I love um, supporting my own team here. And I feel like until that's seamless and in a good place, then I, I wanna give it my all. And frankly, um, I feel like vacation is a break from work. And if you're always on vacation, it doesn't feel like a vacation. And I think, you know, sometimes people are just wired to, to work. And, and I think that might be me. Um, and <laughs> I worry about the alternative is, okay, at what point is it no longer fun to just always be goofing around? Um, and the other thing I do, I wanna set a good example for my kids. We live in a community of um, a lot of success and wealth. And I really want to demonstrate for them that hard work and work ethic is a critical piece of your success and life is come easy. And even when it does, or I get lucky, or I sold my business and these great things happen, I still owe it to the team that supported me through that whole process. Um, and I think one thing I, I feel like I'm missing a little bit, and I think one of, um, maybe Jill mentioned that the bringing the enthusiasm every day, um, we used to have parties every day and we'd have paychecks and dance around and do <laughs> a little bit of that has been lost in COVID, um, maybe because of corporate and the combination of the lack of interaction. And so one of the things actually on a recent meeting I was on is I said, we need to really think about reinvigorating that and in our own way and not losing, um, I call it our mojo um, and, and the passion and enthusiasm we have for work. Because I feel like the last thing I want um, people always say your your team must have so much fun, and I always say I have to go to work too, right? So <laughs> it be fun for me, um, and when it's fun for all of us, we're all enjoying being together. And we used to do hungry, hungry hippo games where we'd roll around on our stomachs and grab our paychecks and run back <laughs> do things. And it just felt like it brought a sense of together that was more than just work. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that enthusiasm and passion is so critically important. And I do believe it's not totally self-serving because what you put out comes back multiplied abundantly. And so like when I put out enthusiasm and positivity. I swear when this whole COVID thing is over, I'm just going to throw a dance party for college students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, exactly. that's what I, I'm planning on it. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work. It might just be lights and music and reserve a classroom and whoever walks past hey come in and dance <laughs> yeah people need it people need it that extra happy interaction so i agree with you completely. and i looked up the five p's it's passion persistence planning people positivity so there you thank go. you i was gonna say positivity persistence and persuasion yeah all of them yeah thank you so much oh. Yeah, I was yeah. curious myself. All good words. Yeah. I always hold up the five feet. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> See, that's what we do I here at the round table. Yeah, I was wondering why Deborah decided to sell her business instead of doing an IPO or maintain ownership. I got an unbelievable offer, <laughs> and I took it. Yeah, and it wasn't. It I, I like um, going public with stuff. LegalZoom was a, the, our major competitor, and they had. To go public and then they pulled back on the IPO. Um, I had a lot of investors who were interested um, in investing and I always thought, oof, it's hard to work with others to come in and tell me what to do. So I thought there could be this notion of selling. And then um, I had my financial advisor tell me words of wisdom that really set me into a great place, which was basically now you're paid for an education, right? I'm learning from all of these corporate experts who are experts at marketing and, and product development and project management and things that I never did as an entrepreneur, right? I just rolled. And now I'm like, oh, I have to do this marketing role and this product role. And so I feel like I've learned all of these new things from this. And so when I sometimes feel mired by the meetings and the details, I look at it and say, look, they, they're paying me every single day to learn. And um, I do, I think I'm going to do this forever. No, <laughs> this is um, a great time in my life. I, before the COVID, I did a lot of traveling and meeting with these people in person and training. And I also think there's a little bit of a neat role for me as a younger-ish female in corporate where um, 
I'd love to set examples. They asked if I would be a mentor to other young women in the organization that I think that might be what's missing for a lot of women in top leadership in organizations that they don't have examples of other women who've done it and maybe not just the total route of start young incorporate and work your way up for 20 years but figure out other nuances or what works for you when it works for you. And for me, entrepreneurship was perfect when my kids were little. And I asked them probably daily, they would tell you, do you mind that I travel and do this every They're like, no, mom, this is, we're proud of you. And I think, ah, oh, there's nothing better than that. So anyway, I think there were other options, but when I got presented with this and then um, have tried to take every little grain and be enthusiastic about it, <laughs> I learned that, it, you know, the best outcomes. Come. Yeah. And I think part of the issue also is not just the role model for the other women, but also just the visibility of women in society in general. There's not enough uh, focus on the idea of women as leaders and therefore uh, it's unusual to see women as leaders and, and it should be more mainstream. I and agree, certainly. we definitely want it to be mainstream. I, I think it's an interesting conversation. One, I would love to continue. I would love for, for all of you to come back on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. Let's discuss women in business, women in leadership, entrepreneurship. I think it's definitely important. And now, I would we are love to be on that show as one person as well, because I think women in leadership and in business is very important. I think that's the future of the, that we're going to hold. So as for a white male, I tell you that that's very important. Mm -hmm. Will you come back now? You hear Dr. Allen, come back now. Okay. Yeah, it's a very we, important thing. It is. We are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. We have four minutes left of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching this show live, as well as everyone who is watching in the archives, and simply let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance. And we're going to start with you first, Dr. Allen. I'm going to ask everybody out there and all you women on the panel to give back today. I want you to do something that you haven't done before and give to somebody that you haven't had. You know, if you're going for a coffee and buying a coffee from the drive through give the next coffee to somebody behind you for free. I want you to give back and make this world a better place. And I'm going to give you all 52 golden pearls. All you have to do is text me the word golden pearls uh, with an S on it to one 819 717-2515, and I'll give you a golden pearl a week to reshape your mind and make your mind better and really make it that much better a place. This week, week's pearl was on gratitude, which I think we need more of in this day and age. Last week's was on love. Uh, Reese Witherspoon saying, oh, you get more love by giving love. And I think these are the things that are very important. So just text me. Uh, Sharifa will have that number, 1-819-717-2515. She'll put it in the show notes, the word golden pearls, and I'll help you have a better day every week for the next 52 weeks. I love it. I have to go ahead and send my text right now. Dr. Lisa, what do you have for us? So I would like the audience to go to think.tv, think with a Q, T-H-I-N-Q dot TV, to continue the conversation throughout the day and discover activism that makes you think. Change the world one conversation at a time. Amen, one conversation at a time, which is what we are doing here. Lindsay, what do you have for us? I would just leave everyone hopefully feeling empowered to know that you know, small changes are big changes. And if you just take it upon yourself for a little small shifts in your mindset or your actions, it can have big changes. And if you want help with that, um, follow us on social media. You can also go to our website. It is Worldwise Tutoring with an S, Worldwise Tutoring. And I break it down very simply <laughs> to actual practical things you can do as a parent or an educator as, or as a student to get you in the right place. That's what we need. We need more help, more assistance for parent worldwide tutoring with an S worldwide tutoring. Thank you, Lindsay. Jill, what do you have for us? Yeah, mine's um, connection and the importance of just reaching out with a phone call or an email to a family, friend, 
or colleague just to say hello and to check in, or even on the street, just saying hi to a neighbor or a stranger, a smile through your mask. And also you connect with our artwork um, at theartarsenal.com or on Instagram at the.art.arsenal or um, the Writing Den Connect Through Handwriting and Help the Homeless at, the write, at writingden.org and then also on Facebook and Instagram. Yes, we have to check you out and follow you. Help the world, change the world, help the homeless. That is what my motto is and what this show is about. Deborah, what do you have for us? I would say dance. And it's been a little <laughs> during our talk today, but there's a song by Leanne Womack called I Hope You Dance. And I, mm, I love it. I love that know, song. If you have the chance to sit it out or dance, you should dance. So if dance, hope you is dance. Thing, it's my thing, but if it's not your thing, do your thing. And I think that's what's important. Bring bring the you that's you to the world every day that makes you happy. And if you get the chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. Oh, that was so beautiful. I have enjoyed today's show. It was so wonderful. You ladies and Dr. Allen, you were amazing. Can I join your dance party too, ladies? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to save you a dance, Dr. Allen. We're going to save you a dance. dance party. Just wait till you hear me sing. <laughs> we want you to sing. We, I hope you oh, can. Karaoke. All I of love it. it. I love karaoke. Let's go. <laughs> and before you turn my show into a two-hour show, I want to thank you all for being a guest on today's episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I especially want to thank everyone, each and every one of you who tuned in to watch this show live. But even if you watch this show in the archives, you are still as important. I appreciate you, whether you're watching the show three days later, three months later, or three years now, this information is still amazing. It's something that you can learn from. Learn to dance, laugh, have enthusiasm, be an entrepreneur, work your business. But like I said at the beginning, don't just sit there. Don't just watch the show, support the show, visit our guests, visit their website, take advantage of those pearls. But if you are interested in being a guest, please visit the website at ashsharifa.com. Until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.